Oh, yeah, close going. Okay. Uh, it's five past six. I want to call this meeting of the select board, January 16th. Order. And the first thing is Matthew Driscoll for planning commission interview. Come on up. Solutions. Not there. Do you want to go to the podium? Oh, sure. oh okay. I'm sorry. I forgot. Actually, no, you don't. Sorry. It's not. Okay. Talk a little bit about yourself and why you're interested in this position. Uh, sure. So, uh, my name is Matt Driscoll. Uh, relatively recent move to Woodstock. I uh, live on Pleasant Street with my wife and two daughters who are two years old and six months old, two and a half and six months old. Uh, we moved from Barnard in April. Um, and yet we're very interested in joining the Planning Commission. I think uh, we're full-time residents of Woodstock. We have a vested interest in uh, seeing the town continue to sort of develop in a way that maintains its character, but you have the ability to walk to stuff in the village. There's sort of an economically viable uh, Village Center. Um, so I'm excited about spending some time on it because it's very relevant to uh, our life in town. Have you been to any meetings? I haven't been to a planning commission meeting. I'm planning to go tomorrow. I have been to two design review board meetings for my own home, and I've spent some time with Laura and a few other folks. Our meeting this month was rescheduled, so he would have been here. He would have been at that meeting. Um, can you make all the meetings? I should be able to make the majority of the meetings. I travel a bit for work, but not so much that it would interfere. Any other questions? Any board members have questions? Harry? So, did, you, did you have a question? I just have one, we just have one vacancy and um, uh, one applicant. Is that right? I, Matthew was appointed, approved by the trustees last week. If he's appointed by the select board, there will be one more opening after this. Anthea, who had previously come before us, has withdrawn her application and candidacy because she had scheduling conflicts. So that's, like Eric said, Matt would be filling one of the two vacancies. I move we appoint Matthew Driscoll to the Planning Commission. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Congratulations. Thanks, Olivia. Thank you. Okay, next is uh, we're going to an exec executive session to discover a lawsuit pending a probable civil litigation or prosecution to which the public body may or may not be party. So at this point, we will go into executive motion. Uh, motion I would move we go into executive session as you just set forth. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Folks, if you don't Aye. mind, you know. Or Nikki's gonna break this out. Yeah, Nikki, where does the breakout break out room? Look at the door. Yeah. Thanks. Next is additions and deletions from the post agenda. I have an addition under other business if we have time. We did all did our planning commission interview, but I was going to ask the board um and Stevens left um for an appointment, a special appointment to the Planning Commission as an ex officio non voting member in accordance with our Planning Commission bylaws for myself as I've resigned as a voting member as of December. So that'd be under J. And uh, we're going to delete uh, discussion number seven update on the on farm restaurant amendment for planning zoning. Anything else? Citizens' comments. Um, so I know you probably can't say very much about this. There's one here. Oh, yeah. Roger, oh, my name's Roger Logan. I live in Woodstock Village um, and town, I guess, officially. Um, I know you probably can't say much about this lawsuit that you were talking about, but can you can you say whether the town has been named as a party to this lawsuit? Uh, I would say we've got no comment on that. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to, I, I'm going to say something that you guys are not allowed to say, I'm sure. Um, 
at some point when you're comfortable, if it's legally possible, I think it would be a good idea for the select board to make a statement in support of the development review board's position. Um, and again, I don't know if you're allowed to or not, and I would have to be much more um, much, much more uh, diplomatic than I would be if I was making such a statement. Um, you know, we can't continue to, we, we can't do anything if one person can stop anything. Um, and it's, so, so I would just suggest that when and if it's possible that the select board make a statement in support of the development review board. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, this is, um, this is Tom. In Tom, we lost you. You, you broke up. Um, uh, yeah, this is Tom Ayers at the Vermont Standard. And uh, following up on Roger's um, comments, I'd just like to ask why um, an executive session was held at the very outset of the meeting, um, uh, as opposed to at the end of the meeting when they're customarily heard. Um, thereby, you know, basically excluding the media and all of the people in attendance in person and on Zoom um, for about the last 10 or 15 minutes. Um, uh, is there any reason why this had to be item number two on the agenda as opposed to the end of the agenda when executive ses sessions are more customarily held? Oh, just a decision we made based on the way we run the format of the agenda for tonight's. Right, right. But 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 based on what, Eric? Uh, just the way we want to have a discussion if we had to have a public discussion after the executive se uh, executive session. Okay. Roger seems to to have some information that suggests that this is about a TDRB decision. Can you verify whether that is it, information is accurate or not? Uh, no, it's not at this point, Tom. And if you want to, uh, I think, ask me more questions, I'm happy to have a discussion with you offline about this. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure that the public was fully aware of, of um, what the situation is here. Thank you, Eric. Yep. Can I just clarify something? Yeah. I just want to clarify. Uh, I, I'm Roger again. I just want to clarify. I have not received any information from anyone on the select board or in town government about what this suit is. I was making an assumption, which may or may not be correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Okay. Moving on. Manager's report. Uh, I'll be very brief uh, tonight. Uh, one is. Um, We've moved some offices in town hall. So if anyone comes in, we're still working on signage, uh, but some offices have been moved around. Uh, so if you are confused when you come here, just ask us, or we're happy to help. Um, second, we have um, a DPW cruise out again tonight after being out all weekend, after being out the weekend before, after being out the weekend before that, um, after uh, the flood this summer. Um, so they're doing the best. Um, I ask for everyone to have patience uh, on the road as they try to clear as much as they can. Uh, it's a lot of snow the last few weeks, and uh, they're doing the best they can. Uh, but if you have any issues, please call my office, and we're happy to help you uh, via those public channels. Financial report. Um, so there's no more lot of kind of. Uh, sent out uh, a few board members had questions that hopefully I answered ahead of time. Uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions now. Anyone have anything? Anyone? Uh, I do have a question about the financial report. Um, I didn't know if going forward the select board wants to get the financial report on the agenda. Um, I can also have it emailed out monthly and we have a quarterly financial report update on the agenda. I didn't know if that's like what I feel in one way or the other. I do that. So they, I'm sorry, they would just be emailed to us, but not on the agenda. So not made it'd be, public. It'd be made maybe every quarter we have a financial report um, and can email to the boards a monthly report. And obviously 
any resident who wanted them and asked for them, they received them as their public information. But it just seems not that many questions usually publicly about them, so a way to create some of the agenda items. We have three people from the public here. I I I want to I want to make sure that yeah. everybody feels that they're being provided with information. So does that sound? If you got the financial statements quarterly rather than monthly, but you could come in and get them if you wanted, does that meet your needs or should we keep doing what we're doing? I'm looking at you, Roger. Yeah, okay. Susan's knitting. And um, <laughs> maybe I should get a lapel mic or something. Um, I would like to see monthly financial reports put on the website somewhere. I think it makes sense what Eric is saying since you generally don't have lots of questions and what questions you may have are probably going to be in super detail, so it may not be the best use of your time in a meeting. But I would like to see information, a lot more information posted on a website with metrics and data and et cetera. So um, that, but, but as, a, as an agenda for the meeting, it certainly makes sense to me. We post it. Uh, we can try on a website. We don't have the best website in the world, uh, mm -hmm. so we can see what we can do. Or emails that people ask. Yeah, no. It's... I mean, the financial reports are online already within the packet. That's right. Yeah. But if yeah, but take that, them out of the packet. Yeah, then only be quarterly. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oops. Okay. Difference. Do we need okay. a motion or just? No, it's just on there because it's always been on there. So I don't think we need a motion to. It's not legally required to be on there as far as I know. Okay. Now we have the. Wastewater treatment plant, are they on? They're here. They're here. Oh, sure. I'm sorry. You, I, I thought you looked familiar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Who's standing here? Can, you want to sit over here? Uh, you sit wherever you want. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's all comfortable for you to sit down. And... Nikki, can you let me share my screen, please? Yep, you should be able to. Oh, great. That's that's good because I do have a couple on slides to click through. Okay. Uh, you want me to keep going? Yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah. So uh, just to introduce myself, I'm John Olin. I'm with Boyle Tanner Associates. I'm the regional manager out of our Vermont office. Uh, and with me today is Kirsten Warden. Uh, you want me to introduce Kirsten, <laughs> Kirsten D. Pietro Warden, um, senior environmental engineer with Boyle Tanner. And the technical lead of the study. So we just completed the preliminary engineering report for the uh, Woodstock, Maine wastewater treatment facility this past year. And Eric had asked us to come back in and, and just give a give an update about what, what, what our findings were, where the existing plant is at, and talk about a little bit about the next steps uh, to keep the project moving forward. So uh, this is going to be a short presentation, and then we'll open up for questions at the end. So I'll just kind of click through and um, get right going. So right here, project location, pretty, pretty self-explanatory for, I'm sure everybody in the select board, if anyone in the public isn't aware, just off route forward. Um, uh, adjacent to uh, the Attica River there, uh, kind of north coming out of town there. Um, and background, where, where the plant's at. So it was originally constructed in 1968 uh, with a berm, uh, flood berm and dewatering pump station added in 1973. Uh, additional plant additions, very clarified. Talk a little bit more about the process and what the, what the different uh, meanings of these components are. And the process building 1982, 1988 had the sludge storage tank addition and another one in 1998, as well as the blower building. There were headworks improvements made in 2006 and then the facility, for, or, which brings us to today where we're proposing some facility upgrades and kind of point out that 1998 was, that was the last time a major upgrade was done where a lot of the equipment was replaced or refurbished. Um, so this is typical that in the span of about 20 to 30 years, 
uh, 20 years being right about where the equipment starts to run out its uh, end of life. And, and we're, we're past that now since 1998. Let Kirsten right. hand it here. So um, flow enters, um, hard to see on this. Okay, there we go. There's the influence sewer, enters into your headworks building and a headworks building is where we have screening and grit removal, screening to get out the big pieces of what we affectionately call rags in the wastewater industry, but it's getting out um, a lot of the, the paper and, and junk that's coming down your sewer line. Um, there's also grit removal in that, in that um, building in that phase and the importance of grit, grit, getting grit out of the out of the stream is that it protects the downstream equipment such as pumps and wear and tear on equipment. From there it goes into the um, aeration tanks and that's, that is labeled as aeration and digestion tank. It's a very unique package tank and this is, this is an old steel tank with steel interior walls and in the center of it is a, um, an interior tank that is used for holding wasted sludge from the from the clarifiers. This this particular um, piece of this particular structure is in very bad shape right now. So that is the biological process. It goes into there, it's aerated. From there it flows to the clarifiers. The clarifiers are a solid separation process where you slow down the you slow down the flow and you let the the um, sludge, the heavy sludge kind of settle down to the bottom. That is then pumped out, and that is what's sent back to the interior, um, the interior tank, or that's inside of the aeration in circle. From the clarifiers, clarified effluent, which is nice and clear, okay, flows into the chlorine contact tank where it is dosed with sodium hypochlorite, and it travels through um, a set of, a set of serpentine channels um, for its detention time and effective disinfection, and then it is discharged to the Ottauquechee River. Um, there's also what you see up there called a dewatering pump station. When the river elevations are high, so back in the 70s, the Army Corps engineer built a berm around the plant to protect it from flooding from the Ottauquechee. But when the Ottauquechee level is high, it is required or it is necessary to boost effluent flows up above that level. Um, and that, that's exactly what that plant does. It's all hydraulics. It kind of jumps over a weir from the chlorine contact tank, goes into the dewatering pump station, and then there's one pump in there from the 70s that boosts flow over. And I know that they use this um, not necessarily for flooding events right now, but when there's ice jams also on the river, and they need to get the flow up to a higher level. Um, also, you'll see there's an operations building. Um, there are the two storage tanks. So this, um, this facility wastes sludge from the middle of that aeration digestion tank. From there, it is pumped into these two storage tanks. The facility holds sludge there and only dewater, contract dewaters it. They have a, uh, an outside contractor come in, uh, Paul Stanisak, and he dewaters the sludge. He does that twice a year. So they're able to hold their sludge for six months before dewatering. The generator and blower room um, provides backup power to the plant. The blower room provides air to those large storage. And then, then there's a garage, uh, maintenance garage on the far end of the site. So that's what's existing right now. Um, I wanted to talk about historical flows. Um, the plant is currently running at about 50% capacity. Um, it's designed for a 0.45 um, million, sorry, let's call it 0.45 million gallons per day or 450,000 gallons per day. And that's that red line that goes across the top. Okay. Currently, um, it's averaging about half of that. A point about 0.224 million gallons a day, and that is the blue line. Okay, what we have seen happen is that um, the plant is starting to peak well above its design peak hourly flow. The design peak hourly flow is about is well, it's not about. It is 0.75 million gallons per day, and it has peaked over that at 0.846. Um, that's just significant because as you move towards into design, you have to look at these peaking factors that happen when you're in a rain event and use that peaking factor, which ended up being um, a 3.8 3 peaking factor to then come up with what your design peak hourly flow should be through the plant. You have to design your infrastructure for that. You have to be able to pump it. This plant has pumping from the influent up to its, so if you can't pump that, you're gonna flood the plant. 
It's also important because um, for disinfection, you need to be able to disinfect that peak hourly flow. A lot of the other processes you only design to an average day flow um, because you're able to kind of dampen out uh, the, the aeration requirements for, for a biological system. But disinfection has to, has to be um, designed to a peak hourly flow before it can be discharged. So having said that, there are a whole bunch of processes at this plant that do not meet that treatment at the peak hourly flow. So I just wanna. So starting with the headworks, the headworks is one of the areas that does not, is not able to pass, um, is not rated for that peak hourly flow. The, the, um, the slide's hard to see the chart on the side, but if effectively we went through and did a condition assessment of all the pieces of equipment in the headworks and you can see a lot of it is at the end of its useful life. A headworks is extremely corrosive environment. You have hydrogen sulfide gases that come in from the influence sewer. It corrodes metal conduits that the electricals, um, you know, being held up, uh, paint, everything is, is essentially starting to fall apart inside the headworks. Um, the aeration tank, as I mentioned before, is a steel tank. Um, it is, it has holes in some of the interior walls and support beams that hold up those walls to the point where the operator isn't 100% certain he can take one side down for cleaning without a catastrophic failure of those walls. Uh, clarifier tanks are all of the interior metal components are, um, are at the end of their useful life and there are some co concrete repair concerns in those tanks. And we'll just show you a couple of pictures. Pictures. Come. pictures. So that is the corrosion on the left side. That is the corrosion in that center wall and beam that holds up a, a, a steel wall down below between the two sides of the aeration tank. There's two trains. And then that's just a, a, a picture of some of the concrete defects that we've observed. Um, so there's, there's a significant amount of concrete work that needs. So to, to what Kirsten was saying on that steel channel that's totally corroded on the left picture, it, uh, what you were saying before, if you needed to uh, lower down one of the aeration, uh, one of the, the vestibules or the, you know, the tanks down on one side, that would create when the wall would be out of, like you'd have a Unbalanced. force on one side of the of hydraulics or pushing up against the wall. So when it's in equilibrium, when it's filled on both sides, it's it's okay. But if you were to need to do maintenance, that's where the critical... Uh, and risk is. and the maintenance that needs to happen is there's aeration diffusers at the bottom of the tank that are important to impart dissolved oxygen into the liquid. That's that is the whole part of a biological of the aeration tanks. You're pumping air in. It helps to degrade nitrogen, helps to degrade um, biological o oxygen demand, and that's where your treatment's happening. Without oxygen, you will not get. You will not meet permit. You will not meet permit um, effluent requirements. Oh, a couple more pictures. That's the interior of the um, one of the clarifiers that is drawn down right now, and some more some more pictures of just the tank concrete um, falling. The chlorine contact tank um, does. So the issues with the chlorine contact tank are that it does not meet the state standards of disinfection. You need 30 minutes of detention time at the peak hourly flow, and it does not meet that currently. The other uh, major deficiency with the chlorine contact tank is that it is below the, um, I, I know it's below the 500 year flood elevation, which is a new requirement for the state of Vermont. So as I just mentioned, aging infrastructure. We have an aging headworks. We have um, aging influent pumps. Uh, the the aeration tank itself is in need of being replaced completely. The clarifiers need internal components, and the chlorine contact tank needs to be um, redone in the disinfection system. So that's those are the, those are the needs. Um, there are other ancillary uh, equipment, you know, uh, waste wasting pumps, uh, blowers for those aeration, those big st um, sludge storage tanks. They're old. They're inefficient. 
the technology has come a long way since that equipment was installed that would um, lower, lower the energy costs. Most of this equipment, like an aeration tank blowers, the sludge holding tank blowers, they're on 24 seven. They're on all the time. So there's a lot of improvements that can be made um, from an energy efficiency point of view to two different areas of the plant. No. Okay, so our proposal is to, we're gonna start with, our proposal is to redo the headworks completely with a new headworks building that's off to the side so that it could be built, um, constructed while the plant, one of the tricky things about proposing um, an upgrade to a plant is keeping the existing plant operational while you're building the new plant because you can't, you can't not meet your effluent permit requirement. So we propose building a new um, headworks right next to it um, we'll bring bring the flow in from the influence sewer. That headworks will have uh, a new screening and grit removal. From there, we'll flow into the intermediate pump station. We'll, we're going to reuse the existing wet well, replace the pumps with pumps that are rated to pass that peak, that, that new peak um, hydraulic flow, hourly flow. From there, we're proposing to build new aeration tanks um, this biological process, we're proposing a anoxic oxic. So anoxic is um, in the absence of oxygen. So this is the first stage. And then you flow into an aeration stage where you're imparting um, dissolved oxygen into the liquid. That is the process that you'd want to use to meet your nitrogen limits that you are, that this plant has um, to discharge to the autoquichi. So it's a, it's a favorable environment for um, having nitrogen consumed by the by the biology, the microbiome, the bugs in the, in the wastewater, let me just put it that way. Um, it gives us flexibility to have a recycle line, a nitrate recycle line internally. So there's the flexibility to um, change the, the uh, biological process to be more enhanced nitrogen removal or for phosphorus removal. So we're looking at different um, flexibilities with recycle lines in there. So basically anoxic to aeration, oxic, to the clarifiers that are there, reusing those existing tankage, but replacing all the internal part. From there, we'll, we'll, we're going to demolish the, um, demolish the existing aeration tank after we've built the new tank. Then we'll go to a new UV disinfection building. And our pro we propose that you get a, get away from chemical disinfection. Um, the chemicals that are involved for disinfection, sodium hypochlorite and sodium bisulfate, you have to chlorinate and then you have to dechlorinate so that you aren't poisoning the river and the fish, the aquatic um, life in the Ottaquichi River. They're nasty chemicals. Everything in those rooms corrode. They're hazardous for your operators to use. And so we are proposing that you change from that to a ultraviolet disinfection. These are lamps, if you will, and they sit in a channel. And uh, it's a, a wavelength that can kill the, the D RNA and DNA of, of bacteria. And they're used all across the state of Vermont. It's a very common. Um, your South Woodstock plant has a UV disinfection process. Um, by dem demolishing the existing aeration tank in the middle, gives us room for in the future if we need to build a third clarifier. If flows to the plant increase over time, there's room for a clarifier there. The other thing that it gives us um, some real estate for is for a um, potential, a future filtration building if, if the state of Vermont imposes a total phosphorus effluent limitation on the plant, which is most likely going to happen in the next permit round. And what would that permit round be? Um, I believe your permit is up in 2025. Um, it, the plant may be able to, with a new process, the plant may be able to meet a total phosphorus limitation if it's around, if it's a 0.8 milligram per liter pretty easily, some chemical addition. But if it's any lower than a 0.8 milligram per liter, we'll require a tertiary, what we call third tertiary process, which is a filtration type process. 
And very commonly in the state of Vermont is uh, like a cloth media filtration process. You think of it as a coffee filter. You're putting or like a cheesecloth. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. You're putting, and you use, and you'll you'll use some kind of um, coagulant, like a metal salt, like an aluminum sulfate, that helps um, it helps bind the solids and the phosphorus, the parts that can be chemically bound. There's soluble and there's particulate. So the parts that can be chem chemically bound into a larger flock that can then be separated out of the waste stream. So that gives you flexibility for the future. Um, and then the last part of our proposal is to redo that, um, that drainage pump station. Um, like I said before, it has one pump that dates back to the 70s. If that were to fail during a, during a flooding event, that the whole, the whole place would, the whole inside would fill up. Um, we also proposed some upgrades to the operations building, things like um, the lab. I mean, the operators are eating their lunch in the lab. That's, that's not sanitary right now. So having a dedicated office and lab space, um, I believe some new windows, just some energy efficiency improvements to the building. Um, we're looking at replacing the, the aeration system inside of the sludge holding tanks. Those are diffusers. There's other mixing opportunities as well that are that are energy efficient. So we, we could look at different alternatives during uh, during final design for that, and to replace the blowers that feed those two um, those two sludge holding tanks. Yes. Yeah. Question. Yes. So there's currently no filtration tank proposal yet. No. Correct. But we're pretty sure in 2025 it'll become mandatory. Yes, and it depends on what that limit is. Okay. It could very likely be met with um, chemical addition okay. at this stage. Typically, if you're given a a new limitation in your permit, you are also given a compliance schedule saying you have so many months to design it and then implement, construct it. So it wouldn't be like day one yeah. in 2025, like, oh, you need to meet this limitation. Okay. okay. Total cost of everything that Kirsten just went through, you know, just to give an approximate. Important question to keep in the back of our minds all the time is, is between 20 and $25 million. Is that in today's money or 2025 transcripts? That's actually got a, a, a slight, it, it's projected for bidding in April 27th. 27. Yeah, there's, I didn't. Okay, and uh, quickly going through the schedule of where we're at. Um, you know, step one, preliminary engineering report's been completed. And we're, this is the start of it. I think this would be the, what we would consider this early part of public outreach. So um, as we move through 2024, um, the next really phase for the project, the next key milestone is getting a bond vote. Um, you'll need a bond vote to advance with funding programs. Um, CWSRF is the main funder at this point on the project uh, that we've been working with. That Eric, we just submitted a, 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 pro a priority project list application, a PPL. Uh, so that 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 third bullet down, the funding agency and coordination and application. So that's that's the other part of it. So over the course of this year. Obviously, this is a large expense for the town to incur. So we're going to look to offset, mitigate it the best is, that's possible out there uh, with the reality that some of this stuff, it, it can't be avoided. Um, it's, at, it's, it's at the age, it's at the end of the useful life. So uh, we're going to work with you to do the best we can. But there'll be more public outreach. This is, like I said, this is a start. This is just kind of a round one where we're at. Um, and we've talked to Eric and the town about some other opportunities coming up through the summer to get people engaged with the project. Uh, but moving towards that potential vote in November 2024, one of the benefits of doing it then is that will be a presidential election, so you're going to get good turnout. Uh, so we like to try to get these things right into that. Um, and then the next step would be final design and permitting, uh, mostly occurring after November 2024. But we, there are some services that could get started in the summer, like survey, 
the field services because if you're going to start in November after the bond vote, you want to get some of those moving along to keep the project on schedule. It takes a while. So to get through final design and permitting in 18 months, that puts you at May of 2026. Um, so step three really begins uh, at its earliest. And I think we just mentioned 2027, but at its yeah. earliest would be May of 2026 um, for completion, a two-year two-year construction window completion October 28. Now, all that said, these are rough dates. So anybody from the town thinking, we'll have our new plant in 2020, 2028. Uh, select board knows that this is assuming a lot of things that so, assuming some of these key milestones get. i have a question so we, you want us to vote on a bond mm -hmm. with an estimate and then the bid comes in and we're really shot you want that estimate to be secure the state of vermont the clean water uh, state revolving fund loan requires a successful bond vote before you can um, go for a construction loan. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Yep. It's a challenge. challenge. It creates a challenge. So there, there are ways to, mm -hmm. to word it that we can work with you to help um, offset some of the risk. And the CWSRF program actually, as of this past year, updated some of the language that, that's allowed uh, for municipalities because that is a it's tricky. It's enormously tricky. hard. Yeah, it's challenging. And and we've been escalating like the 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 numbers, you know, out so that it's not. I mean, those dollars that we're telling you, that's the number we're going to have you bond is like at bid time. It's it's extended out. So it's about the best we can do. Oh, I'm not blaming. Uh, no, I know, but it, it's yeah, it's tricky. It creates a major challenge if you get bids back that are above what the town bonded for, what the, what the public had approved, that that's a challenge. So we recognize that and want to work to make sure you have a dollar that's going to be safe. I had a question. This, the, the new plan looks obviously like it includes a lot more efficiencies and, and necessary upgrades. Does it also, and I'm sorry if you said this, does it also increase our capacity for development? So the, the upgrade does not increase your permitted flow. That is that is something that you can pursue, but that is a challenge um, getting it permitted to have an increase in flow. It's generally um, challenged by environmental groups. Okay. So it, it is possible to do it with this design, but you're saying it would. I'm saying so it's possible to get an increase okay. for your, for of capacity, but this pr proposal is for your permitted capacity it's not a no change to your permitted capacity so your your original design your permitted capacity is 0.45 mgd your proposed design flow is still 0.45 you're operating at 50 percent right now so that so you have plant capacity right now and i know we've talked a little bit about giving you some numbers about where that that puts you yeah you I, I think the email we had you said potentially 500 more units i think was the quote we gave uh with the new plants um, but can you talk maybe if the board or the town came back and said we want to be able to add a thousand more units or 1500 more units permanent aside what would be the i think you have an estimated cost won't hold to you but like what would be the increased cost <laughs> <laughs> so we have, we have to so, but, but <laughs> you know, you're yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, so just so that, you know, the, the people at watching and in the room there's going to be a question of this is a 30-year yeah. plant why are we not trying to add 2,000 more units? Right. So what would be the if if we wanted to do that? So I would. So capacity is tankage, right? Okay. So the more the more flow you're going to add to this plan, the larger those tanks have to be. And I'm okay. talking about mostly the aeration tanks. If we were to expand, um, if you were to get an increase in your capacity for the plant, you would definitely be into a third clarifier. Okay. That clarifier is probably. I'm just going to throw like. Sure. A million and a half tanks okay. for a new clarifier. Um, those tanks are going to have to get wider, longer. Um, it might, at that point, you might want to go back and look at some other um, treatment processes. For example, like an, a sequencing batch reactor, which we just designed and built in South Woodstock, that might be a better, um, a better technology, a better process for 
where you know where you're at now at 50 percent and to be able to ramp that up to the flows that you want to see okay you know because those work in like modules where yeah. you can keep adding on to it okay. so we could we could if that's if that's a direction that the town is looking to like we we think in you know 30 years we want to add a thousand more units we can also you know keep keep real estate for adding say a third train to mm -hmm. those tanks right you okay. know like a whole nother a whole nother set a third clarifier room for a filtration building with you know mm -hmm. with the ability to pass that kind of hydraulic flow but that would be something that i would encourage you to think about to project out kind of like a kind of like a 50 yeah you know like a like a master plan for wastewater um, so that you're investing smartly in this upgrade that can be then phased for a future upgrade, if and when needed. So while you have your financial crystal ball out, <laughs> um, I guess I'm concerned that we're, you know, again with the timing, bond vote in November, and then in 2025, we may get news that requires us building this third tertiary process building. Um, so. Do you have an idea of what that cost would be? I'm, and I'm going to say a tertiary building with filtrations is about two million dollars. Okay. And I'm throwing big numbers out. No, I I know. Yeah. A ballpark is helpful. I wonder if that could be included in the bond for it future. It could. It could be. You know, so so you bond out. What I what I would do, and I've designed it this way, is a building that houses the filters and the UV, it's all inside and you flow straight from the filtration into the UV um, channel. And then it could also have a, a, a room on the side for chemical addition. That's that's what I would like. I mean, if I had my, yeah, if you had your way. my artistic. <laughs> <laughs> I think to what you said, Kirsten, I think the key is to, if you're at half your capacity now, the and you're projecting growth to have flexibility. And the, the good thing is your site does have space. You know, some of the sites, you know, well, Southwood is a really tight space, but this this has more room. So if, if things are, if as we're going through the preliminary design, that Kirsten is going to lay it out for that extra train on the aeration tanks, um, that's a good it's a good thought. Like that allows you room for growth in the future. But you you would want to go through that permitting process first. To make sure that you know before you invest this this large investment, um, build the 500 units, get yourself near to capacity before you start. So why I want to stress that that's a permitting mm -hmm. nightmare is <laughs> that you're not just increasing your flows. The state's going to look at the receiving waters and what its ability to accept pollutants. So if you have you have a nitrogen loading to the Ottaquichi and it's dictated by the Connecticut River, the Long Island Sound, TMDL for nitrogen. The whole any anybody that discharges goes to the Connecticut has a nitrogen limit. And it's a it's a loading. It's the amount of pounds. You're only allowed so many pounds. So what that means is if you're increasing your flow, you've got to treat to lower limits. And treating nitrogen to lower limits in cold climates means bigger tanks. Okay, so it's like it's a it's a more advanced process than what you have now. Um, so that's a, a, and the state would come in and say, okay, well, you're only allowed to discharge this many pounds of um, biological oxygen demand, this many pounds of total suspended solids, this many pounds of nitrogen, this many pounds of phosphorus. So your treatment would have to. They're not going to let you tr discharge more of them. Mm -hmm. They're going to just require that you treat to a um, same amount of pounds, but the concentration will have to get lowered. You have to treat to higher standards. Okay. So there's a a chance where this could be built or renovated, kind of as is planned for the most part. But the option for more construction for more economic growth could happen separately in the future. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. Sorry, I have more questions on the slide board. I don't know. Carrie, do you have a question? No. I have one. Yeah. 
Is it going to look any different than it does now? <laughs> On the outside, you mean, Greg? Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, the, do you not like the way it looks? I'm fine with it. Somebody's <laughs> going to complain. Now, Woodstock's a problem. I understand that. I just thought I'd get the, one step ahead. Think about this site. It is tucked down. It's not. It's not terribly. Absolutely. It's not terribly. It's kind of a joke in a way, but somebody's yeah. going to mention it. Yeah. You're old. <laughs> <laughs> not a bad idea. I'm sorry, Roger, did you have a question? Yeah, I have like a couple of technical questions. Um, it looks like a lot of this this um, scoping is for this peak flow, if I'm not misunderstanding. Or, or So what causes that peak flow? What causes that is infiltration and inflow into your collection system. So when you have rain events, flows spike. So that goes into the storm drains. You do not have a combined system. You have it's direct um, infiltration points, that's the manhole, or it's direct. There could be a connection somewhere from say it's not like a roof a roof drain from a from a building is connected into the sewer, or it's connected to a sump pump in someone's basement that then discharges to the sewer. Is there any way to mitigate that? Because those are huge peaks. I mean, those you know you're going from from a, a capacity line to like five times the capacity line if I'm reading the chart right. Um, that's what a robust uh, sewer use ordinance and enforcement can mitigate. That's, okay. that's, that's a town ordinance. And then enforcing that ordinance. Right, right, right. You need the enforcement. Um, we have done for other for other municipalities where you do smoke testing of a sewer, you know, and you start seeing smoke coming into someone's home. <laughs> or, you know, gutters and you're like oh there's a direct connection there that goes into your into your sewer line those are things that you could you could perform to try to find them in our experience um that solves some of the problems um, for all of it many many communities around the state have th these issues with aging infrastructure with aging collection systems they crack the old ones were asbestos uh, cement pipes um they crack. There's the bricks at the top of the the manhole that hold the the ring in the road. You know, they shift, they move. Water. So one way or the other, water is infiltrating the system at a at a tremendous rate. Okay. Um, and the other question, a technical question, is about the sludge holding tanks. What happens to that sludge after we're finished holding it? So it gets dewatered. With uh, what that means is. Um, Paul Sensack is a contractor. He comes in with a large piece of equipment in center field. He spins it. He sucks, spins the water out of it, if you will. And um, he then takes what we call a sludge case. It's drier, about 25% uh, solid. It's a dryer. And then he has to go dispose of it okay. in either a landfill. Um, some, some communities are up to Quebec. Um, some Really struck it. It's nice of us. There's a landfill in Quebec. There's um, there is a resource management inc in New Hampshire, which uses biosolids from different facilities around the state. They turn it into um, topsoil. Okay, but somehow or other, it's taken away and hopefully disposed of, or or maybe even used in it. Yes. Okay. All and right. Is, that's actually one of the, probably the largest um, operational costs for the. Taking it away is the contracting of dewatering it and disposing of it. That is probably the largest okay. line Thanks. item budget. Does the current cost include uh, remediation, not remediation, but like, uh, I guess, careful disposal of the asbestos and other elements we talked about? Um, it would include. Okay. We haven't found that that is usually a, a high ticket okay. item, but um, we would do a lead and asbestos survey that's required by the state of Vermont for funding, for public funding. Okay. And um, it would identify any materials. Um, usually the asbestos is in ceiling tile or floor tile. Um, it would identify those um, so that we can inform the contractor, you have to dispose of this a certain way. And there are, there are landfills that accept. 
Are there any questions on anyone on Zoom? Uh, Wendy, Wendy. question. Wendy, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Wendy Marinin, Village. Uh, thank you. This is a very helpful, clear presentation. Um, my question is, is there a way to estimate, uh, maybe by percentage, how much the cost, the operating cost of the upgraded plant will increase? Does that um, make sense? It does make sense. It's not an analysis I have done at this point. Um, to, um, I have not. Let me just say, I have not done that analysis. Um, if anything, the effic energy efficiencies should not increase the electrical demand on the plant. Um, it should make it more favorable. Like it'll, it'll decrease the horsepower sizes of the different um, pumps and blowers. So um, it's probably going to be about net even with energy costs. Um, I'm saying that. Don't hold me to it. Um, but that's... Um, that is one thing. Chemical costs will go down, except for because we're switching from a chemical disinfection to ultraviolet disinfection. But with that is energy usage associated with the lamps. Um, so there's there's a there's a difference there. But um, and if we're getting into phosphorus removal, we will have new chemicals that will be required, um, and those those that has an annual cost as well. Um, so the answer. The short answer is no, I do not have that estimate. That is something that we would do in final design so that you can look at your um, user rates to see if they're appropriate. Thank you. Uh, so if there are no other questions, what's the next step here? Um, what does the, the board need to do? What, what's for those 10 next steps? question so yeah uh, you and I were working or we talked about I, I need to prepare an engineering service agreement for the next step of public outreach funding assistance trying to help coordinate that and then uh, getting into the uh, final design starting in November but like I said there are some things that you want to do this summer in preparation so you can roll right in so, um, and that would go through the CWS prep process so that takes a little bit of time the first step is us to draft it up, I would run it through you. We would submit it into the DEC, their Water Investment Division. They do a review, that it looks good. Then we can prepare the loan application uh, for step two final design, which could include all of these services I just mentioned. And then that way you have a favorable loan in place to keep the design moving. Uh, that can be done prior to the bond. That's part of part of the services you get is help to get make sure that you get the public outreach for the bond. Uh, so that would be the next step, and then we would talk about giving the select board a schedule of what they would expect to see in milestones over 2020. Um, I have one last question about the sludge. Are there other <laughs> are there other options? Um, I guess like alternatives for for us specifically in Woodstock. In terms of not disposing of the sludge and, and taking the water out, no. So I know I, I so this is a statewide. This is actually a regional wide issue okay. of sludge final disposal for sludge. Um, as we see um, the state and the region grappling with PFAS concerns yeah. in dewatered sludge, um, where how is it going to be disposed? It is a it, Again, it's a regional issue. Okay. Um, right now, Woodstock does not have to dewater its own sludge, which is energy intensive mm -hmm. and would require another full time operator okay. to do. So the um, the mode the mode of operation right now is to bring in someone else to do that and pay that cost. Could there be some savings down the road if you had um, if you wanted to invest in more personnel there and have a full-time person dealing with mm -hmm. the sludge. Sure. Do you have the land for it? I think you do. However, I would change the way it's digested. So right now you have raw sludge that's being a class B product. It doesn't meet certain requirements. 
Um, there are different communities, say like the, the city of South Burlington, which digests their sludge and gets it to what they call a class A biosolids. Yeah. So it meets different requirements from the EPA for time and temperature reduction of certain vectors. So it's not, it's, there's pathogen reduction. Yeah. It heats it to a certain, a certain level. Different communities, there's a couple of communities around the state, Brattleboro, um, I believe Montpelier, um, Middlebury's looking at digestion. Okay. anaerobic digestion those are pretty big infrastructure I, you don't have really the the real estate to put in a digester so to speak for that and that is that's energy intensive mm -hmm. um it's a lot of you know you have to heat the sludge to a certain level um i see where again crystal ball the state the area where we should be heading into is regional digestion of sludge okay. and incineration or drying to which can be, um, destroy PFAS, but it, it needs to happen at a regional level because the the cost benefit is just not there for individual communities. Yeah. And it would make sense at a more regional. But that's, that's we're not there yet. Yeah. And neither is New Hampshire or Maine. So the facilities that now take the sludge and dispose of them, do you see them in the next 10 years, like being at capacity for their ability to handle sludge? You mean like the landfills? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. There is, and, and it, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's keeping, to, it's yeah. keeping the state regulators up at night. Okay. They're not sure what the solution is going to be. Yeah. For just, for, uh, with Canada closed for a period. It's closed for a period of time. It might o back and it might open back up. Um, the facilities that reuse the biosolids for beneficial reuse, like they turn it into um, B trans has a spec. What do they call that? It's a transportation topsoil. You can use it on a on a on a road project. Okay. Yeah, you know things like that. The manufactured topsoil. That's the name of it. Um, they won't accept your sludge if it has PFAS in it. Yeah. So there's a level of testing. Um, it's it's hard it's hard to say. Yeah. I wish no, I, could, it was, I wish I could give you yeah. like. No, I'm just curious if we're gonna keep making sludge. Like at some point, you we're gonna run out of space to put. Yeah. So like, do we need to be thinking even broader about what we do with the sludge? If we're every treatment plant in the state of Vermont produces sludge. The only ones that don't have are lagoons. And it sits in there for 20, 30 years. It still produces it. It still just produces doesn't it. get pulled it out. It doesn't often. get pulled out. And then when they do need to pull it out, we're talking a couple million dollars yeah. to remove that sludge. So it's a, it's, a, it's a cost you have annually, or it's a cost you have every 20 years. Yeah. Sorry, I just have one more question. Um, this may be goofy. Um, but I know that places like Burlington are testing the wastewater for for pathogens. Does, do we, is there anything that needs to be done to make that possible here? So say we wanted to look for COVID spikes or whatever. Um, I believe, I'm not sure if they're doing that with the state of Vermont, um, the health department, or if they're doing that with your UVM. But yes, they, they've been tracking COVID outbreaks through testing at certain different parts of the city. So is there anything about the design that needs to change to be able to do that? They, they're, they're, they're doing a collection system to know. So they just get it downstream. Yeah. Okay. Upstream. Upstream. Okay. So they can tell like, oh, the, the new north end. Okay. Viking or the south end or something like that. Um, it, it, it's not at the treatment plant. Okay. But um, to that point, it's not a goofy question. Sampling happens at the influent of a plant. <laughs> um, they're, they have a composite sampler. They sample. For, um, they don't sample for pathogens, but they're sampling for um, biological oxygen demand, the temperature, the pH, the total suspended solids, the nitrogen, phosphorus at the beginning, and then they have a, a composite sampler at the end so that they can show their compliance with their discharge permit. All right, that makes sense. Yeah. Great, thanks. Okay, that's it. Yeah, that's it. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. I'll see you. Thank yeah. you. Slow. Slow. Yeah, slow. Yeah. yeah.
city. Uh, next is the liquor license for the Woodstock Farmers Market. My okay. favorite thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the liquor. Yeah, the liquor <laughs> part. So as always, uh, this board has made their frustrations clear with the state on how this is being handled currently. Uh, without really information on the select boards, I think in the past, the board has voted in favor of these with the assumption that the state is doing the due diligence on their end. Um, so this is the same situation. I'll make a motion that we approve the liquor license application on with the proviso that we assume the state is doing their job. Is there a second? I'll second. No, a second. All those in favor? A second. Aye. All right. Aye. Aye. EDC. I don't know if anyone here is here from the state. Anyone on? Does not look like it's over. We just table that till next next month. Yep. Opera. Um. So at a recent meeting, um, the board voted to allocate $7,000 opera funds to uh, pay off the Carlton Hill Road project. Um, there's approximately $46,000 left to be allocated. Um, Mark Hunter um, has given me a list of different um, things around town uh, that could be could be fixed. Um, also, based on information from the chair, I went to the fire department, uh, their recommendations. Um, Chief David Green um, has a quote for approximately $19,500, um, which is to install a new electric cable line uh, up in South Woodstock. It is where um, the police and fire radios are at that site. Um, it is 50 years old. It's a drip berry in the ground. Um, it's on uh, a landowner's property, um, and they asked if it could be installed um, differently. Um, so this would be uh, about $20,000 to kind of go up there and uh, fix it. So it would be uh, new and continue to work and give uh, radio coverage to the fire police up in South Woodstock. Um, so I have one copy if you guys want to. Take a look at that. Um, again, it does not be voted on tonight if the board does not want to. Uh, what about a cell tower up there? It's all a cell tower, you mean? Yeah. That's an option we can potentially look at. I don't want to look at it. But. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's right above my house. Okay. We need cell coverage. I don't want any microwaves coming down to me, but would the power line be big enough to sustain something? Or is that a different whole, another whole? That's beyond my uh, intelligence at the, at the moment. I, I, I can look into it. What did we approve in South Woodstock before? Didn't we approve some kind of? We upgraded the. Um, Transmitters okay. repeated. Okay. And if the board wants more information, I can have Chief Green type up something more in depth. Um, I think we're at a pretty good place, only about forty thousand dollars left. Um, so it's just upgrading the power line that's 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 there, or moving it. Moving it's it. moving it. Yes. So it's fifty years old. I believe it's buried underground. Yeah. And so we. Have to so it's, it's on somebody's private yeah. property. Yeah, and we and we pay them to allow that to be there. And we'd have to, and and it's this, still going to be on the private property, right? Though. But this yeah. is going to put a conduit instead yeah. of having yeah. a direct buried, which is a big difference. Yeah. And we put this on the agenda for next month too, if you want. And um, we're still working on figuring out how much we had to allocate the air pack. So at that point, we have a solid number. We might be able to allocate the rest of the money somewhere else too. It may be it may be worthwhile looking to see what it would if the electrical would uh, help with the uh, cell phone. Yeah. 
I don't know if it's a good spot for it, but there was back when Phil was involved, there was talk about that. I saw Tom up there. What are the other things that Mark has? Uh, it's floor infrastructure, it's culverts, uh, some repairs. Um, my suggestion would be if the board was going to approve something like this, um, it could then approve the rest of the money just for uh, infrastructure culverts for uh, work and market that you can choose where you want to allocate the rest of the funds. I'd like to see what it would, what the extra electric, if the extra electric would, what the cost would be. Oh, you mean with the cell tower, you mean? Yeah. Okay. I mean, it makes, you know, if if it, we can do that, it would make sense. Yeah, I'll look into it. Okay, thank you. Does this solve part of the problem with the police not having <laughs> coverage in the village, South Woodstock? I'm not sure if it will. It's not making anything with that. I'm not that. sure if it will make it. updating yeah. what's there. And now there could be some knock-on yep. effects, but the purpose of it is not to increase. It's to keep those status quo. Yep. That fine with everybody. No, with that. And as we move on, in case people are minded in here, we did um, delete discussion number seven on the on prem restaurants. That that won't be discussed tonight. So if anyone's waiting for that, that's not going to happen tonight. Uh, we don't have an update ready. Okay. Discussions. Town report, tell us. The town meeting is coming up, and I believe the. Uh, select board always kind of discuss what they want on the cover potentially. So, uh, Nikki Nurse, who is in charge of, I'm oh, sorry, um, Nikki Levaticus. Um, Congrats, Nikki. Um, who was the Taylor Town Report? They didn't know if the select board has uh, an opinion on what they want the picture to be this year on the cover of the Town Report or not. How about you, Eric? <laughs> <laughs> <Not. laughs> me, me and Roger, how about that? Too? Yeah. That goes out to a vote, though. <laughs> you don't have a choice. Um, I haven't given any thought. What about the star? Picture of the star. Southwood star. Picture of the star. 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 That's that works too. You just make a jump. That's only my yeah. first and only town meeting report, then, because they <laughs> run out of town after that. Um, the star is a good idea, I guess. I don't I was just thinking it's yeah with all rotary's efforts and everything to yeah do the star okay. we'll work on that if we have need more guidance we'll come back and ask and have AI generate it <laughs> I'm sure they've got plenty of pictures sure yeah. <laughs> I'll put the cross I think it should be a bottle of the FEMA water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right. Storage. Um, so as we discussed in a uh, good time with Toil Terry there, there was a discussion about the current sewer ordinance and um, how it states um, that all expenses uh, with sewer have to be taken on by the users. Um, with the conversation the board had uh, last meeting, I went to a lawyers of that language um, and they actually came back um, and the way they read our ordinance and also uh, the state statute uh, 24 BSA 3613 and 24 BSA 3615A4 um, and our sewer ordinance in article uh, 4.3 uh, that we do not need to amend the ordinance, that that ordinance um, Gives a select like board with their statutory authority uh, to allocate expenses among users and non users. Uh, so it's their guidance that if the board going forward wanted to have any sewer expense, bond or no bond, be allocated between users and non users, uh, you already have the authority to do that based on their reading of the ordinance. So no change to ordinance needs to happen. Um, if to have all the possibilities available to the board as a can I, sorry, um, just to mirror back what you're saying. So the, the ordinance that we had, they're saying is fine as long as if we want to change it. Because we had proposed changing the language. To no, so you don't need to change anything. It, okay. the, the ordinance as written gives you the power to allocate funds, allocate expenses any way the board sees fit. 
So as it's currently written, you could come out and make an ordinance tomorrow saying that all sewer expenses have to be paid by non-sewer users if you wanted to. Okay. Um, that gives you the power uh, as Mary read. Were there other things in the ordinance? I thought there were other things in the ordinance that we wanted to update. No? We don't have to. We don't have to. Nothing. Uh, the only thing they added uh, that uh, that we want to do is um, in that same ordinance um, add in a phrase accepts, accept what's uh, enumerated, which means you could read the ordinance currently that uh, user fees could be used for anything, i.e. a new police vehicle uh, to pay my salary or something else. Okay. Um, and, and they recommended updating that so it would only be sewer related stuff. Okay. The ordinance also does, you know, it, it recites how you get your permits and everything like that, and that's all obsolete. Yeah. The permits, even for people on town sewer, if they want to add a bedroom, it's a town, it's a state permit now. It's no longer a town permit. Yeah. So our our ordinance is antiquated in that regard. And I, I think this is an issue throughout the town and village of the ordinance that have been updated in probably decades. So I think... Um, so we should update it anyway to include the updates to the process. Yeah, so I think we should go through and okay. put updates in. So if we're going to change it, we can change the. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to follow up to you. Can I make a comment? Oh. Um. I think everybody knows who I am at this point. Um, that's good news that, that the ordinance gives us that flexibility. Um, I still think. For a November bond vote, that's going to come a lot sooner than we think. We should start. I don't know if it means forming a committee to discuss how costs are allocated. Hopefully, a small committee that doesn't squabble too much, or whether that's something that that you would prefer to do as a board um, to come up with 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 whatever kind of formula you can come up with and the justification for that, and then. There's a huge public, a huge public yeah. education that's going to have to happen, um, and because nobody's going to be happy with it, because everybody is going to pay. Um, but, and I think, I mean, these guys did a great job of putting it all in very user-friendly terms. So, I mean, I understood ninety-seven percent of what they were saying. Um, so, but I think, you know, I think it's. Relatively soon, you should come up with a, a method for coming up with how are you going to allocate costs and how to communicate that to the the public. Thank you. Town hall update. Okay, I'll go. With that. Um, so, if you guys recall, in December we voted to. Um, create a working group made up of. Um, Eric, Ray, and myself um, to explore options when it comes to town hall and beyond. Um, and so we met last week, um, and right now we are in the information collection stage um, of assembling some information so that we can um, better refine the criteria that we outlined in that meeting, um, specifically as it relates to what we consider financially affordable. Um, and we will meet again before the next February meeting, and I hope to have some really great uh, action items and updates for that. We all have action items that we're working on um, for that meeting. So, uh, remind. great. I will send email <laughs> to remind everybody of their action yeah, items. I didn't get any. Okay. I thought we get them all to you, but I <laughs> so um, it was a productive meeting. We're moving. Moving ahead, forging forward, um, and I will be excited to have more information to share at the February meeting. Okay. Town meeting prep. <clears throat> the two things we want to discuss was the 1% sales tax and then also uh, the informational session. Um, so I got uh, back from alerts today um, that I was asked to look into if the village had the ability to opt out if the town passed it uh, based on uh, research from our lawyers. They're not unable to do that. So if the town passed the 1% sales tax, it would um, be in place for the entire town. Um, so that's kind of one information. Uh, we are still looking 
MLR is doing most of the work uh, into how the online um, sales tax would work and what that could uh, look like. Uh, so we don't have definite answer yet, but uh, she's working towards that. Um, and then I think the board talked about potentially having uh, the informational session not that Saturday right before uh, the Australian ballot, but the Saturday before that to give people extra time um, if they wanted to um, send in the ballots, you know, through the mail, they'd have a week and a half to have it received by a ballot instead of less. Um, so I believe the state law that it has to be 10 days before Australian ballots. I think that Saturday is the 10th day. So if it's the board's desire to do that, I'll just confirm with the LCT that that is appropriate. Um, and if so, we can go forward with that. But the 24th of February is the one we're looking at, I believe. Right. Um, it's the, um, yeah, I looked. Conference also having their information on that day, so I would assume it's fine, but I think you should still check. Yeah, um, that, that works for me. Eric, can I bring up the um, the nonprofit articles? Yeah, probably you want. Yeah. Uh, okay. So one thing that I've always um, thought is that people should get more information about the special articles and the nonprofits that are asking um, us to vote to give them money. And I I I think people understand that that in, you know we've our budget sets a tax rate, and every one of those petitions that gets approved is going to, going to increase that tax rate. And, and we all know that we have some nonprofits in this town that do tremendous work and deserve um, that money. I am not sure about others because they don't come on the Saturday meeting. They don't make presentations. So my proposal was to ask just four or five questions of each um, nonprofit that's going to be on the ballot. And the I believe the standard would if they keep them short or they're giving they're given editing approval and i know we have some people from the standard here but i think that they would agree to print those and um, you know possibly we also put them on the list serve just to give people more information when they go to the polls about the nonprofits they're voting for good uh, idea great idea okay other questions i had a few questions oh, i don't yeah. know where they are <laughs> let me see if i can find them that might be able to I think the more information we can give the voters, the better outcomes we can hope to have. Here we go. And these are, I mean, I just did this quickly. So um, if anyone has any other ideas, and I, I had a heading that please note that they may be published in the standard in the listserv, so keep your answers brief. Otherwise, they might be edited. Um, describe your organization's mission. How many Woodstock residents are either employed by or volunteer with your organization? Describe your work specifically in the Woodstock community, and how will the money uh, being requested be used in Woodstock? So, kind of. Yeah, I think my only maybe consideration or addition would be if they are also receiving funds from the budget. I don't know if anyone else has a feeling on that. Yeah, because a lot of people don't know. I think that's a good question. Okay. Actually. Yeah. Roger, anything else you're yeah. dying to know? Um, I'd like to see the number of people served directly by that organization as opposed to indirectly. Um, and if they have any additional revenue sources that they could be tapping. Thank you. Work on those. Perfect. So, conflict of interest. The petitions are due Thursday, so we'll know who's taking out yep. petitions at that point. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, an update on the conflict of policy. Uh, a little while ago, uh, there was a joint meeting by the, the select board and the trustees um, asking to update the conflict of interest policy um, to kind of uh, state that if you worked for the municipality you couldn't run for elected office and vice versa um i ran that by our lawyers um and they strongly advise we do not include that as it infringes on uh, people's freedom to run for elected office in the united states um and they thought that um 
it's up to the voters to make that determination uh, in the ballot box, uh, not for uh, officials to do that, and that there would be a potential that we could be sued um, if we made that law on someone wanted to challenge it. Um, so that's kind of an update. I let the trustees know, um, and they uh, kind of agreed to let the contract of interest policy remain as is without any updates. Um, so I wanted to give that update to the select board as well today. Can I make a suggestion or request then if we're not going to update the policy and maybe maybe I can talk to Nikki about this, but maybe we have a yearly training on conflict of interest and, and recusal and, and how recusal happens from decisions. Um, if we can't, yeah, we can't achieve that from the conflict of interest policy. I think maybe it's worth a refresher for all of our boards and committees. That's right, Darren. I think we've talked before about um, after town meeting and village meeting day when they're potentially at new boards or new okay. chairs, vice chairs, to kind of have a a refresh of what that look, year is going to look like for the board and maybe have a conflict of interest uh, information session at the time would be very useful. Thank you. Calendar of events. Uh, so now we talked about this again a few times, so we just want to kind of get this off in the ground running um, of having uh, at least one board member, not, not two, get together and kind of sketch out kind of what the years will look like when things will be discussed. Um, and so, A, the board has a plan to work off of, but also the public has that knowledge as well. So sometimes it won't be as rushed putting things on the agenda, people not knowing when things are going to be discussed. Um, I think a great example is the Quill Tanner and the main wastewater plant. Uh, if we go forward with all this stuff, I have an outline of how things are going to happen throughout the year uh, could benefit us and also the public. Um, so I just want to see if we can kind of get that ball rolling as well. Um, again, so hopefully by at least March um, after town meeting, we kind of have a outline of what the year looks like for the board. And if anyone wants to tackle that with me, I'm happy to work with whoever. Perfect, Susan. Everyone's looking at me. So <laughs> if I keep bringing this up, <laughs> no, I think it's great. No, it's great. That's fine. Yeah, I think it's great to have planning. Okay. Other business. Oh, this is me again. Yeah. Yes. Um. So I'll give some more context. I'm going to uh, be hazard oh. as well. Oh, hi, oh. Wendy. Wendy, you're on mute. Hi, Wendy. Oh, that, oh, thank you. Thank you. I was saying, okay. Thank you, Eric, for bringing this up. That My question, I thought it was for the town meeting, but it's really about the calendar. Um, my sense is that voters will be asked to make decisions that impact taxes several times this year. For example, what I've been hearing, certainly we have our budget vote, um, and we will also be asked to vote on the school proposal at um, at the Australian ballot in March. But what I've also heard is that now we have the ballot, the bond vote potentially in November for the sewer treatment plant. We we know that there's a discussion coming forward about the wastewater, I mean, the water company, but we don't know how we're going to how, what it's going to cost and what it's the impact. And then the town hall discussion, I recall, was tabled to be put in front of voters in November. So my question is, is that true? We're spreading out decisions, but how how can we vote in how can we vote on anything without the looming future of other expenses is my concern. Although I appreciate separating everything, you know, it's a tough one. I know it's tough. So I, I think the goal of separating them has been uh, to have the votes when the board and the public has all the information relevant to make that decision. Well, I agree. Uh, yeah, that's good. And uh, also just uh, if we take a bond vote in, say, November, it does not mean that we'll, we'll go for the money the next day. Um, it could not be for six months or seven months, depending on you know, what's, what is required. Uh, so I think you heard tonight that with the coming wastewater plant, just to go into the process of getting potential grants and loans, you have to have the bond vote first. 
It doesn't mean you have to go out and get that money right away. Uh, when it comes to things like uh, the Woodstock Aqueduct or, or Town Hall, um, those decisions have not been made yet by the board to pursue or not to pursue. Um, so there are always going to be things moving in the future. Um, I think we've all talked about since I've been here at least of some deferred maintenance in Woodstock and the consequences of that. And this is one of the things we are facing a lot of things coming at us at once. And I think as we went through the budget book or the budget for the next year, we we're very cautious of not adding any new things in the budget we didn't need to under the assumption of trying to keep the tax rate as low as possible for residents knowing what was coming. Um, but at the end of the day, some of the things need to happen and, you know, um, unfortunately, it's going to be a, a burden on, on us, um, but the goal is to try to do it in a way that minimizes uh, increases for everyone as, as, as best as possible. Thank you for explaining that. My, my, my concern slash suggestion is that this kind of question be addressed at the informational meeting so that people aren't frozen at the ballot. On the, in other words, anxious about so anxious about the future, we can't decide about what's in front of us. Um, if there's a way to take what you just said and map it out a little, that's that would be super helpful at the information meeting. Just an outline, like you just said, um, that was helpful. And then a sub question to that point is, um, oh shoot, now I've, uh, oh shoot, I forgot the secondary, I'm sorry. But you, you hear what I'm saying, um, yeah. that the, that the, um, the context is important. Oh, I know what my sub, my sub is it also at the information meeting, if you could highlight what is in fact, what has been set aside in capital reserves for some of this, which I believe we've done a little bit recently, I may be mistaken, but if, if the voters could have that highlighted to them at the information center. That's also a calming note. That's great feedback, Wendy. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for listening. Thanks. Okay. All right. Am I back? Um, so for context, um, the planning commission, as we discussed, is down to voting members. We've had two applications. One of them has been withdrawn. Matt was just approved. Um, we have a provision in our bylaw to um, that actually encourages a select board member to be an ex officio non-voting member of the planning commission. And I am um, coming to the board today to ask for that appointment for myself so that I could continue to serve on the planning commission, but as a non-voting member. And I'm happy to bring up the statute if you wanna see it. And I have a question about Suzanne. Yeah, no, my, my question is just having discussed conflict of interest, what yeah. happens when this board is then discussed? Was that your question? It was, yeah. Okay. <laughs> what happens when this board is then discussing something that was discussed planning commission level? So it's my understanding from Stephen that that wouldn't be a conflict of interest because it's inherent in the by like the bylaw actually requests a board member be a part of the commission and the planning process, if that makes sense. I'm happy to get further clarity on it. Um, because you wouldn't be voted on. I wouldn't be voting. Yeah. I would be a member. So anything that comes to the planning commission, Laura may have been involved in the creation of the policy or shepherding through a certain thing, but the final vote she would not participate in. So therefore, she wouldn't have a recommendation one way or the other, I think is the way they're looking at. But we can look into verification on that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, we should. Okay. I mean, I think, because I, I, I know you've done just a ton of work on the planning commission, which yes. is, we're all very thankful for. Yeah. And my guess is that that might not end. Yeah. And so yeah. even if you haven't voted on something, if you've drafted something, it just is kind of uncomfortable Marky. at sure. this level. Yeah. So that's just my only No, I think it's comment. a great suggestion. We can. So I guess we could table this for next meeting, yeah. but yeah. we could vote to see if they will want to vote UBX Fisher and then see what guidance is from lawyers. I'd be, I, I'm, it seems like everybody's more comfortable with getting clarity. And so I think we should wait until yeah. we have clarity. Yeah, but you can still go. To yeah, still planning to go to the meeting. We'll let you go to as many meetings as you want to go to. Yeah. <laughs> hey, approval of the minutes. 
because I know you have one update. Right? Yeah, um, the December 18th minutes, when it comes to discussion, the it's D, three, four, and five, the sewer budget. It talks about that Bill Davy suggested implementing a smaller increase now instead of a larger one later. And I don't think that was accurate. I think that Jill was saying, I think Jill advocated that we increase the sewer fee to pay for some or all of the work at Brayside and so that, you know, there wouldn't be, we wouldn't be drawing on capital that maybe we could apply to reduce sewer fee in the future. And then I think we also voted on that, which changed the budget. Is that, am I remembering that right? Yeah, so I had the budget kind of up and we were talking about it as we went through. So I made the changes based on select board's guidance that. Um, so I just think that the minutes should reflect that because it presently says that um, we approved the sewer budget as proposed, but we don't say that we changed the budget. Including the changes made. Yeah, and I think we should reflect what the change was. Yeah. from what was first presented. So we haven't make that change. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I think so I would move that we approve the other minutes. So December 5th, December 13th, and not approve December 18th till it's changed. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And that brings to the end of our meeting. Is there a motion to adjourn? No move. For a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Second. Aye. Okay. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.